Every week we go to the scriptures because it's there that the person and work of Jesus are most clearly revealed. So our sermon this week will be from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2, verse 1. But first pray with me. Gracious God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, our good, and our maturity. Grant us so to read, hear, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who has risen this day and lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now, hear the word of the Lord from 1 John, chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning to you uh, gathering at home online with us as well. Uh, before I jump into the sermon, I want to I want to tell you that at the nine o'clock gathering, uh, when Jenna led into I Will Exalt You as the second song, uh, I just started, started tearing up because um, that was an additional song that we've added back into our gathering, which it's only one song, but it's also the first time that we've had two songs at the beginning of our gathering since March of last year. Uh, and it was just a really beautiful moment to realize that. So that got one whoop at nine, none from you, that's fine. I will let Jenna know, all right? Uh, last week we began a series uh, in 1 John, and this is what we said. We said that 1 John is at times direct, um, it's confrontational, it's got some angst to it. Um, there's also some of the great themes of the Bible woven into this letter, but where a number of other books in the New Testament in particular have a sort of clear progression to them, uh, 1 John is a little different. 1 John, these themes, images, they, they sort of cycle their way through. And the reason for that is this. First John is written much more like a sermon than an ancient letter. It may have actually been a sermon. We don't really know that for sure. Uh, but it's written much more like uh, a sermon than a letter. It doesn't have uh, any of the real characteristics of ancient letters, but it does have characteristics of sermons. And we said last week that John opened the letter with a bit of an apologetic bent to it. What I mean by that is this, that, that he opened the letter uh, in ways that were familiar, but also in ways that you would address non-Christians. He, he wrote and began this letter addressing uh, these churches the way that you would address non-Christians. And the reason for that is that in the backdrop of this letter is a group of people who have left the church, or a part of this church, or these churches that he's writing to, that have left to start these new communities, and John sees them as walking away from the faith. He sees them as having walked away from Christianity, to, to having walked away from God. And, and he, he's got some angst in him for the churches he's writing to that they wouldn't follow them and walk away from the faith as well, walk away from God as well. That's why we used the plank analogy last week, that he saw them in danger, in real particular danger danger of being led astray by these uh, people who had left the church. And so he began last week at the beginning of the letter challenging their view of Jesus, addressing their doctrine of Christ. This week, he's going to address their view of themselves. 
their doctrine of humanity, if I could say it that way. And, and here's how I want to frame things up today. I want to frame it up like this. Every relationship, any and every relationship, for it to flourish, it takes honesty. And I don't just mean honesty like two-way honesty, you know, me honest with you, you honest with me. It, it also takes honesty with ourselves. It takes honest, let me, honesty with ourselves. Let me, let me illustrate it like this. If I have an anger problem, and I mean I'm just flying off the handle left and right, day in, day out, can't get under control, but I convince myself that I don't actually have an anger problem. Um, I'm justified in my anger because these people around me have problems. And my wife comes to me and she says, um, hey, why, why are you always so upset? If I respond to her with this, um, Amanda, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And by the way, you know the real problem? You're a little too sensitive. How's that gonna go? Not well. It's not gonna go well. Every relationship, for it to flourish, it requires honesty with ourself about ourself. The point is this, that their view of themselves, these people who had left the church, the way that they saw themselves would have made it virtually impossible to have a flourishing relationship with God or with each other. What was that view of themselves? Let's get into the text and find out. So here's the structure of the passage that we're looking at. It's in some ways similar to the one we looked at last week. Um, there's a foundational statement that, that John is going to make. He's going to lay a foundation, and then he's going to name and identify three teachings from this community uh, that are he sees as false, that he then will counterpoint correct each one of them. All right? So foundational statement, verse 5, three teachings that he's going to counterpoint each one of them as we go. And so we're just going to make our way through it. But let's start in verse 5 um, and see the foundation that, uh, that John is going to build his case off of. Here it is. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, in him is no darkness at all. So let's talk about darkness first. Um, in the Bible, darkness is not just a physical reality. It also uh, it symbolizes, represents um, emotional realities, spiritual realities as well. Uh, about 200 references to darkness in the Bible, 40 of them in the book of Job. This man who's lost everything. Now, you probably have heard the phrase, dark night of the soul, where you just can't see God anywhere. That's kind of what's referencing here. But there's a few other examples that I think really narrow in and are more um, explicit and applicable to what John is doing right here. And those examples are that darkness also represents evil and wickedness. It represents the fool or foolishness. It represents ignoring divine revelation, right, the darkened mind. I, I, I have this God who has revealed himself in the scriptures, and I'm going to ignore it. And so when light is contrast with darkness, here's what we see. Intellectually, light is truth. Darkness is ignorance and error. Morally, darkness is evil and light is purity, which is why uh, John Stott, very helpful to me, theologian, um, said, said this. He said, of the statements, essential, up, <laughs> I misread that at 9-2. I have no idea why that sentence is so difficult for me. Of the sentence, <laughs> not sentence, um, of the statements about the essential being of God, None is more comprehensive than God is light. None is more comprehensive than God is light. Now, if I could try to bring this into the context of 1 John, narrow it into 1 John, I, I think that this is what we see. We see a God who is a God of light is a God who desires to be seen, a God who desires to be known, a, a God who desires to reveal himself. If I could illustrate it inversely like this, 
Um, I, I learned early on in my marriage, very early on, like two weeks in, that my wife does not like to be frightened. Here's how I learned it. We're in our apartment, I'm in the living room, I see her walk into the bathroom and I sneak past her and get into the closet. When she walks out of the bathroom, I jump out, ah! you know, and she 360s in the air and is crying before she lands on the bed. Never done it again. Not a single time. Maybe. Here's the point though. If I'm trying to hide from my wife, do I turn the light in the closet on? No, I turn it off. I get in the dark little space of our closet if I'm gonna hide from her. If I want her to see me, I turn the light on. God who is light is a God who wants to be seen, who wants to be known. It's why the word fellowship is woven throughout this letter. Because it's relational, it's also a picture of redemption. That being brought out of darkness into light is a biblical image for redemption. And so when God, I mean, when John lays the foundation that God is light, here's the primary thrust I think he's making in this letter. One, one, he is a God who is holy and pure, but not distant, not, not hiding himself from you, but a God who wants to be known and wants a relationship with you. I think that's the foundation that John is laying right here. And so it's a personal picture of who God is. And now he's going to get to the first teaching of theirs. He's going to name and then correct. And so here it is, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So here's the first teaching of theirs that, that he's just going to name. So I just want us to see what it is. It's this, that we can live perpetually in the dark and still have a relationship with God. Here's the first teaching of theirs that John is going to jump into and counterpoint. is that you can live your life perpetually in the dark and still have a relationship with God. And by walk in darkness, I think he means two things. One, it means ignoring revelation ignoring the revelation of God in the scriptures and choosing to understand God in light, in light, maybe not in light, that's probably not the best use of the word, uh, but in the darkness of your own understanding. So choosing to ignore what, what, what God has revealed to us about himself in the scriptures and choosing to concoct a God in my mind that's based on the darkness of my own understanding and then two, to live in open sin while not calling it sin. I think that's why he uses the word lie. Why would anyone do this? Why would anyone want to just live in open sin without calling it sin? I think, I think the answer for them would have been, uh, the truth is that we like sin far more than we want to, to believe. I think that certainly was true for them. Probably for us, but we'll get to that in a minute. So how does John counter this? Look at verse 7. Here's his counter. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. So let's break down his response here in verse 7. It starts with, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Walking in the light, not walking in the darkness, it means, one, uh, prioritizing holiness as God is holy, prioritizing purity as God is pure, and then two, being known as God has made himself known. We have a God who has made himself known, and therefore, in response, we live our lives being known. And as we do, we have fellowship, which we defined last week as a just spiritual relationship with one another. That as we prioritize holiness and being known, the depth of our relationships in the church grow. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. This word cleanse um, it, it, it goes beyond um, being forgiven. It's, it's a step beyond being forgiven. It's to, be, uh, to, to have the stain of sin just erased from you. And the way that it's written, uh, the way that it's written here by John, present tense verb, ongoing activity, continuous process. It's not, something that's, it's not referencing something that happens. He's referencing something that happens. And so when we put this 
together, when we take his response here in verse seven, we bring it together, I, I think this is what we see. I think we see that there is direct causation and correlation between the depth of our confession of sin, the depth of our transparency in being known, and the depth of our relationship with God and with others. Those are directly correlated. And when, when we confess our sin, there is a particular cleansing that is happening to us. John Stott, again, he said this, said the condition of receiving cleansing through the blood of Christ and enjoying fellowship with each other is to walk in the light, to be sincere, open, honest, transparent. Listen. At home. You, you, you want to be healed of your addiction to porn? You want to be healed from that addiction that no one knows about? You, you, you want to see healing happen from, uh, from that anger that just, that rage that sits inside of you that, 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 that only you in the shower actually let out? You wanna see that dealt with? Here's where it starts. Take it to the light. Let it be known, let it be seen. That's step one. So the first teaching that John is countering is this. You can, have a, can walk in darkness and have a relationship with God. Now the second one. Look at verse eight. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I wanna highlight that the word sin is singular. Singular, if we say we have no sin, this is not a reference to acts of sin, but to the state of being sinful. And here's their claim, and really, I think it's worse than the first. It's that we are not sinful, we are sinless. They claim they did not sin, therefore did not need to be cleansed. This is the ultimate form of self-deception and a distinct slap in the face to Jesus. But the ultimate form of self-deception, that I am not sinful. And I think at this point, it's helpful to define sin. Um, I, I've heard it said this way, that sin is both breaking the law of God and breaking the heart of God. I, I think that's fair and true and, uh, and, and, and good. I do think the word which might be uh, more appropriate there, breaking the law of God, which breaks the heart of God. Because sin is legal and relational. And so how does John respond to this claim that uh, we, we have no sin? Here's our response, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there's a shift here from singular to plural, from sin to if we confess our sins. Why? Because in confessing sins, you're acknowledging that you are sinful. And this verse, it's, it's one that's been, I think, really beat up and used in some, some fairly inappropriate ways. Um, over the last few thousand years, but especially um, in sort of our window era. Uh, it, it reads a little bit like this, that if anyone is confessing sin, then God therefore forgives them. And so someone's on death row, it's last minute, and they say, yep, I did it, I'm sorry, uh, therefore forgiven. That's not what this text is saying. We know it's not what it's saying for two reasons. The first one is who's the we? Who's the we here? If we confess our sins, the, the we is the church that he's writing to, or the churches that he is writing to. If we confess our sin, it's not going from confession to the gospel, it's going from gospel to our confession. You see, he's not saying that you can uh, use confession to produce grace, it's in response to grace, you live a life of confession. Those are distinctly different understandings of who Jesus is and what he did for you and whether or not you have to earn it or don't earn it. You respond to the gospel with confession. You don't earn the grace of the gospel with your confession. The second reason that we know that's what's going on here um, is if, if we look at the words cleanse and forgive, there's another shift. So cleanse in verse seven is present tense ongoing activity. But here in verse nine, it's not. It's a past tense completed one time action. 
Same thing with the word forgive. And so if, if you could let me read it in a very literal, hard to translate kind of way. Um, any, of you know who, any of you who know multiple languages, you, you know, very difficult to always translate from one to the other and bring everything through in a way that makes sense. I'm not critiquing the translation, but here's very literal what it would say. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to have forgiven us our sins and to have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. You see, it's only when you go from the gospel to your confession that you are free. If you go confession to the gospel and you try to earn confession to earn, I mean, use confession to earn grace, listen, you will hide or you will hate yourself every single time. You will hide or you will hate yourself every single time because without the gospel, you don't have the resources to live a life of open, honest confession in a way that's freeing and not crushing. And so you'll hate yourself or you'll hide every single time. John is writing so that we would have, so they would have a posture of confession in our lives. And now the third error that he's countering. Let's look at that one in verse 10. It really builds off the last. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So not sinful, therefore have not sinned, thus no need to be forgiven. And John's response to this is clear. You are lying, you are making God a liar, and his word is not in you. In uh, Hebrews, it, it talks about the word, the scriptures this way, it talks about as a double-edged sword, two-edged sword, it just cuts you, cuts to the heart. But it also talks about it this way, that it, it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why is that significant? Because when Jesus comes into your life, the law of God, the rules, regulations of God, they get internalized. The way the Bible describes it, it's the law getting written onto your hearts. It was on stone, gets internalized and written inside you. And John is saying that if you say, I don't sin, it's because the law's never been written on your heart, which is to say that Jesus has never penetrated your life. It's a sobering, sobering statement from John right here. And I think this is another place this is another place where John is pleading with them. Pleading with them, don't be led astray. Listen, I, I get, I think John is saying, listen, of, of, of course, I want to believe what they're saying too. Yeah, I want to believe that I have no sin in my life also. But what they are saying, if you buy it, it will lead you away from Jesus. It will lead you astray. It will lead you away from your need for the gospel and the cross. And, and I think that if John were talking to us right now, I think he would say, listen, there are a thousand arguments, a thousand views on humanity that are not that far off from what they believed circulating all around us. And he would say, don't buy them. Don't buy them. There's one understanding of humanity that's gonna take you back to the cross over and over and over and over again. And John would say, it's right here. You can find it in the scriptures as God has revealed himself. Which is why I think he turns with such an affectionate tone now. He says, my little children, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. My little children, don't, don't follow them into darkness. Yeah, their, their view is compelling. Of course it's what we want to, to believe. Of course we want to minimize our own brokenness. Don't follow them into darkness. My little children, I, I, love, I love my kids, but they drive me insane sometimes they're not in the room, I can speak freely. And there are times where I have to get down, look them in the eye and say, my child, listen, I love you. I know that you don't know what you're doing right now, but stop doing what you're doing right now. You, you keep going down this road and this is where it leads. It's the affection that John is writing with 
right here. And the question is, why would he, why would he need to write this to them? Why would he need to write this to them? I've already alluded to it. But here's why I think it needs to be written to them and the same reason it needs to be written to us. The truth is that we like sin more than we want to admit. We do. We like it more than we want to admit. If I could illustrate it, I would do it like this. I, I love Mexican food. I do. This is well documented inside our church. Eating it for me, it's not even a conscious choice at this point. I just get in the car, start driving, wind up at a table at Alma. That's how my life works. And no matter what my blood work reads, and I've got some pretty bad cholesterol, I'm going to keep eating Mexican food. I think that's how sin works for us. I think it's far more ingrained than we want to admit. It's something that tastes far better than we want to admit. So what do we do about that? We finish the verse. That's what we do about that. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus Christ, the righteous. When you sin, you have an advocate. You have someone speaking on your behalf. You have Jesus speaking to the Father for you. And what is he saying? He's saying, I paid for that. You, you don't get two payments for it. I paid for it. I paid for that. What is Jesus talking about when he's speaking to the Father on your behalf? He's talking about atonement. That I have atoned for your sin. And atonement is relational because it's all about reconciliation. It's all about being reconciled to God, that you were reconciled to God. Jesus atoned for your sin so that you could have a restored relationship with God. And because God is light, Jesus plunged himself into the darkness of the cross. The sky went dark on him so your life can be lived in the light. And if I could try to tie weeks one and weeks two together, I, I would do it like this. You want, you want to avoid the danger that John has such angst in his heart for these churches, for this church, for these Christians. You, you want to avoid the danger that he sees them in. You want to not live your life out on a plank. And you want a deeper and deepening relationship with God and with one another. Here's where it starts. It starts with don't deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself about yourself. Listen. I'd say the easiest thing in the world to do. Lie to yourself about yourself. I'm guessing every one of us in this room can write a master class on it. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Instead, fight sin through honesty, confession, transparency, while trusting in the work of Christ on your behalf. And I don't just mean the past work of Christ on the cross on your behalf. I mean the ongoing advocacy work of Christ on your behalf, knowing that he is speaking up for you to the Father when you sin. And if you would say, here or at home online, if you would say that, man, that's great, Brandon, but I'm not a Christian, and this whole like gospel to confession thing makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. But here's what I do know. I know the idea of confessing my secrets sounds frightening. It is. It can be. But when you know the depth of the love that God has for you, and when you know what Jesus did on the cross for you, all of a sudden it's no longer paralyzing. It becomes freeing. Being known becomes freeing. It's not paralyzing anymore when you see that Jesus plunged himself into the darkness for you. The righteous one became unrighteous on the cross so that you, the unrighteous one, can become righteous. Being known is no longer paralyzing and frightening. It becomes freeing. 
And so what do we do? Well, we, we go and we live our lives in the light, confessing our sin, being made known, and we do it over and over and over and over again. That we might feel the angst and the weight from John, take his words seriously, and get off the plank. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the men, the women, and the children that make up Sojourn Heights. They are such a beautiful people. Your work of grace is just so evident in them. Help us to be a people who take these words seriously, who, who fight self-deception as it is so natural for all of us, and fight it with honesty and transparency and confession and being known. And may that confession protect us and guard us and keep us. And may that lead not just away from danger, but into a deeper and deepening relationship with you and with one another. Help us. We, we know that this is a work of your grace. It will take your grace and mercy to do. And so we beg and we plead for you to do it. And we do so in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen.